<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for, for coming this evening. Um, uh, just to, to say before we start that Michael is going to be signing copies of the book, which is going to oh, be available gosh. out in the foyer after uh, tonight's little session. So um, if you want to do pictures and stuff, hang far and do that after the, uh, the Q&A, if, if that's OK. I'm going to start things off, and then I'm going to get you guys to ask some questions. Hopefully you'll have some uh, in a little while, but I get to selfishly dive into your life. Dive in. Myself. You've got that's lots of lovely I've flags. Look at that. That's I love, beautiful. I love, I love these. They're amazing. Yes, yeah, right. Colour-coordinated as well, but I don't need them. because That's your musical here. background. It feels like some <laughs> yeah. or something. Some kind yeah. of yeah, yeah. continental kind of musical yes, instrument. Yes, play it. Um, this is such a great idea because we're, we're very, well I am, and I'm sure a lot of people here are very familiar with your, with your diaries and, and the great yeah. way that you've explained this incredible journey that you've been on in your life. But to condense it to, to just the Python journey was, is such a clever thing to... Yes, well I, I can't claim credit. The, uh, <laughs> the editor, Geoffrey Strawn, is in the audience somewhere, can claim credit. Uh, he was the man who first got the Pythons to um, write a book, the uh, Big Red Book, all those years ago. Um, followed by, um, I can't also the Papa Pock or something like that. I can't remember the second one. Anyway, uh, and Jeffrey w suggested it and said, look, this might be just interesting to people who um, want to know the process of how you write and how the material is created. It's, it's just interesting. Uh, and quite an important thing is the diaries as a whole, one of the, the group of people who've, who've liked them most of all have been fellow writers. I've had a lot of people, David Williams and other people, saying, oh, we'd love the diaries because, you know, we've been through the same thing, sort of the same thing. Yeah. How do you get out of these things? When you quarrel, what happens? Does the work suffer and all that sort of thing? So, yeah, it, it's, it's, um, that was the idea behind it. It should be a, a, a book which people could study and learn. But, I mean, it's, it's not... A, a, an academic book in any way, as you can tell. But I think what, for me, it's, there's a very different, it's a very different read, reading diaries as opposed to a biography or an autobiography, mm. because you have that, it's a, well, it's a, it's a, it's an instant, it's an on, instant honesty, there's no time for reflection or contemplation. It's, you know, it's as you see things there and then. That's, I think, the value of a diary, is you, you make some awful rushes to judgment. You get things completely wrong, you say things one day, um, the next day um, you totally change your mind. But what is important is to remember that we do contradict ourselves. Things don't always go in a straight line at all in any of our lives. We say things really positively the next day, I think, oh, that was a terrible idea. <laughs> and only in diaries do you keep that sort of discontinuity of of logical thought. I mean, there's, in these diaries, I think, I refer to the day when um, we're doing some Life of Brian writing, and Eric, I say Eric, was on very good form today. He produced a song, which didn't seem very special, but he also suggested that we did this, that, and the other, and that's always look on the bright side of life, which is uh, <laughs> now the most, third most played song at funerals, I gather. <laughs> Lucky, jammy bastard, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> but that's what it feels like reading it. It feels like you're kind of, you know, you're, you're in, in the environment with you because you are, it is conversational, it is that whole yeah, way of also, talking. Yeah, and also, you know, the fact is that there were six of us. It's not, uh, um, very few um, writing teams and performing teams of more than two or three. To have six people, all of whom are essential to each other, mm. all writers and all performers, who want to hold the whole thing together ourselves, that's quite rare. And that does, that, that does require, quite, there's quite a bit of sort of argument, disagreement, getting six people with very different lifestyles to agree on anything. Yeah, and, and you're very honest amazing. about all that in, in the diaries as well in terms of, and that's what I found fascinating about it was, was the way that these, you know, these little pockets of partnerships worked yes. on, on different things, you yeah. know, you, you, you'd go away and do something with one person and they'd be in, and then, but you'd reflect and you'd go, it worked quite well with John today, you know, I wasn't quite, yes. you know, that kind of thing. Yes. It's, an, it's fascinating insight into the way that, yeah. that Python was created. Yeah, and as you rightly say, there were the little groups within Python. I mean, uh, I wrote with Terry Jones from the moment I left university in 1965. So we were, the right, we were a writing group together. And John and Graham, I think, wrote sketches together at, at Cambridge. And Eric, who was at Cambridge a little later, wrote on his own. But we sort of, we generally kept those groups, they produce the bulk of the work. Um, then we would have these sessions when we all sit around a table and people would read 
what had been produced over the last three or four days. And that could be terrific. I mean, that was a, on a good day. It was absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was considered a little bit dangerous to go and work with someone else from another group. You know, it was kind of like... Uh, it's like cheating on a girlfriend. Che cheating on a girlfriend, <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, I didn't work a lot with, with John. We did the, um, the thing about uh, the Minehead by-election with Bimler and, uh, and all these the Germans looking at the map. Oh, well, are we going to, oh, we're going to Stalingrad. No, no, we're going to Skegness, you know. And uh, I wrote that with John, and that was, that was good fun, yeah. But generally speaking, um, uh, the most, most of the work was done within the various groups, and it's interesting how we stayed, stayed like that. And is that a, was that a reflection on, I guess, the closeness of those partnerships as well? Yes. I mean, I think it's quite, it's quite difficult to work out a good writing relationship. And, I mean, if it does work, then you kind of hang on to it. And I don't know quite how it worked with Terry and myself, but there'd be flashes like Terry would, was very good on plot and I could bring in characters or something like that. So we, we complemented each other quite well. And John and Graham, although this was a... you see in the book, it was quite contentious because, you know, John... Um, found quite difficult sometimes to work with Graham because Graham's lifestyle, because he drank a lot in those days mm. and just didn't turn up for an hour or so, something like that, and then left as soon as he'd arrived. And then he would only say one word in about four hours. Um, but the word might have been, or the words might have been Norwegian blue. He was always good, you know. It was Graham who tended to get those very, very surreal little off-the-wall touches. Um, and that was an interesting, that was a very interesting relationship. But I think John, they needed each other, but I think John did, did probably the bulk of the writing. When you're involved in, in, you know, putting this together, how does it feel for you to, you are, I guess you have to kind of, not relive it, but you're revisiting it from that first point, you know, for the first day of filming in 1969. 1969, yeah. Is it, is it, I mean, how does it feel to kind of reread those those moments and that experience that you've been Well, through. it's quite instructive because you don't remember quite what you felt always at the time. And as I say, you tend to abridge experience and say one thing led to another, da-da-da, success and the smooth curve. And um, again, when I look at them, I think there are, there are certain things like, um, again, Life of Brian, I, I only rereading the diaries did I realise how much John wanted to be Brian. Oh, yeah. He really did, and I would completely forgotten this. He wanted to do a lead role. He felt he could hold it all together, and we thought that was a waste of John because he had, could do so many other characters, um, and that Graham would be very good at it. But this was the time when Graham was drinking, and 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 John said, I think he says in there, you know, just on one day, he can't, you can't let him do it. You can't even find his place in the script, sort of thing. And I'd completely forgotten that debate. And of course, six months later, Graham nearly died from drinking and gave up drinking. And of course, his performance was absolutely fantastic. You can't imagine anyone being Brian apart from Graham. And of course, John could do all the other wonderful things like the stonings and the centurions and all that. Yeah. I think you, you said it, you were, you, were, you were having a group meeting, I think, at Eric's house when you, Graham left the room and you all had the discussion Whilst yes. he was out the room, yes. kind of going, um, and 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 you know, and, and then he came in, and I think he fell into the room, and and kind of confirmed everyone who was kind of a bit yeah. questionable about it. Well, it was really John who was the main one, and who, who knew Graham best and worked with him for such a long time. The rest of us were saying, "Oh, come and give him a give him a try." So it was it was very interesting that John was the one who resisted that, and that was all. Looking back, I, I just reminded me about all that. And, and we, we've got this in, incredible um, thing happening as well in, a, in a, just over a month's time, these shows. Yes, yeah. Um, <clears throat> no pressure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the live show, which is, is very exciting. What was yeah. the... What, who's, who started the discussion? What was the, the reason behind you all agreeing that it was the right time and the right thing to do? Ah, uh, well, it was about money, really. <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, well, one John thing we can always rely on you John for is honesty. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my own way, yes. <laughs> All the other pythons say, no, no, I'm honest. Palin gets it completely wrong. <laughs> That's the good thing about it. Get, get up with your diary first before anybody else, you know. Um, 
Um, uh, keep a diary and it'll keep you, as, as Mae West said or whatever it was. Um, no, it was a combination of things. Uh, Python had really been... Uh, we, we hadn't sort of made much of the, the company for two or three years because we are all doing other things. And various people, like the, the wonderful guys who do the Book of Mormon and all that in South Park, and people in America saying, you guys, you've got a terrific product here, you know, brand new, you should be selling this. We want. We want. Well, we don't really want to get into all that sort of thing. Then we had a court case. It wasn't a big case, but it was a guy called Mark Forstatter who was the um, associate, I mean, he was producer on um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Mm. And he felt he um, should have got money from Spamalot or something like that for merchandising. It was very, very sort of tiny little thing, but it was fair enough. That was, that was what he felt. Um, we felt, no, it's, he, he doesn't, he's not entitled to that. Anyway, to deal with all this, you go to court, and it becomes incredibly expensive. I mean, just, I don't know if you've ever been to court, but it just really isn't, isn't worth it at all, you know. I mean, um, however, we did, and there's money still tied up in that, which we're going to get back eventually. So, actually, Python was in a bit of a sort of, um, sort of um, lethargic sort of, mess, you know, mm -hmm. there was, uh, nothing much was going on. And John wanted more money for his, his divorce settlement. You know, he'd done, his, <laughs> he, he'd done the alimony tour. Um, He's got to stop getting married. For his fourth wife. I think he's... I think Is it's he done now? I think... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't seen him in two weeks. He might be married again for all I know. Um, I'm not doing another tour just so he can get married again. Um, and, and Terry kept going on about his mortgage uh, up in Highgate. Um, so all these imperatives. But, I mean, that, that was... Somebody said, a guy called, called Jim Beach, who's a manager of Queen and was a friend of John and certainly a friend of Eric at university. And rather than just say, well, why didn't you bring out a book? Why didn't you do a little a campus tour or something like that? He said, why don't you do the O2 Arena? You could sell out a couple of nights, make the money back. We said, oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> so we were, we were, everyone just said yes. Didn't, there was not much debate. I think because actually the prospect of working together and making jokes together and playing comedy together was never a problem. Yeah. We, we love doing that. That's when we're at our best and everyone pulls together and we do enjoy it. It's all the rest of the stuff, the business, the lifestyle, all the various other things we have differences over. But when it comes to performing comedy, that's a, that's a, it's just a lovely thing to do with the guys. Mm. Um, so, yes, so we all said yes, and, um, and now we're stuck with it. <laughs> we sold the tickets. <laughs> well, most of them. Still are, a few you, um, left. are you excited about it? How, do you, how are you feeling about the... Um, it's been 36 years? Yeah, since something, since something like that since the Hollywood Bowl. Well, I'm a little bit apprehensive because, um, you know, we haven't done anything together for, for a while. And it's going to be quite a big show. We've got dancers and God knows what. And because we've got to go off and do all our changes. I mean, I think I've got about ten costume changes, <laughs> including one in drag and one as a Spanish cardinal. And uh, <laughs> when you're over 70, those changes take a bit of time, you know. Um, in fact, men have been known to have heart attacks or bending down to uh, pull their trousers off. So... <laughs> We're just hoping we can get through it. In the meantime, there'll be dance group and, uh, and songs, quite a few songs. Eric's written some new stuff. So it's quite a production. Um, and we don't know, really, until we get into the O2 on the day of the first concert. It'll be the first time we've actually run it in the, in the arena itself. We'll have rehearsed in an absolutely similar space, but it's all a bit nerve-wracking the first night. Mm -hmm. After that, I think, if we, if we can survive that, I think I'll really enjoy it. It's one thing I love about mm. is the in the book is the um, it's when you're when you're talking about those writing scenarios in each other's houses or in offices, and you talk about how you know the reaction between you all to, to that rolling around laughing or yeah. crying with laughter or that kind mm. of thing. It's amazing that does it still have that effect on you? Well, we had a read through last um, November just to check the material, and we did make ourselves laugh a lot. Yeah, it was great. We, I mean. I suppose it's a bit embarrassing that we still find this childish stuff funny. <laughs> but God, if we didn't find it funny again, is anybody else going to find it funny? And I think the key to the success of the O2 is for us to enjoy it. We've got to enjoy it as much as we did 34 years ago. 
So that's not to get too carried away with all the hype and everything else. You've just got to concentrate like we are now, you know, we're just on stage doing a silly sketch and, and, and then it'll work. I think it'll be fine. But we did, <laughs> yeah, we did laugh quite a lot. <laughs> but I remember once we had um, a special screening of the uh, um, Life of Brian. Uh, I think it was the, like, the 30th anniversary, 20th anniversary of the film first going out. Mm -hmm. And we had a special charity screening at the Empire Leicester Square. Jonathan Ross hosted it. And I think five of us, well, Graham obviously wouldn't have been there, five of us were all there, and my God, we sat in a row, and we laughed so embarrassingly <laughs> loudly. It was just, I felt, people are thinking, come on, they've obviously onto something, you know. They can't find it this funny. And we were, we were the noisiest people in the, in the cinemas. Shameful. Mostly enjoying my bits, of course. There they are. <laughs> did you ever, I mean, did you have any sort of, I don't know, at the time when, when you know, you were making the mm. TV shows, the films, that this was something that was going to stand the test of time. This is something, you know, 30, 40 years down no. the line, more that, that no. people would still be excited about it, it would still make people laugh. It would cross generations. Well, I don't think I ever once mentioned that in the diaries. Is there, can you think of, a, of no. an entry where I say, suddenly we've discovered something, we have broken the barriers of comedy, <laughs> we, have, we are legends. It just doesn't happen. We were just terrified at the time it was going to be taken off by the BBC after one series. I mean, we weren't getting paid a lot of money, but that was money we, you know, I had a family. I had um, two children by then. You know, what other work would I do? <laughs> so it was a survival thing at the time. And also, I think interestingly, at that period, 1969, television shows didn't last long. There was no ancillary medium. There were no video, there was no mm. um, download, nothing like that. You could, you know, if you didn't see them on television that night and the BBC chose not to repeat them, that was it. You couldn't get hold of them any other way. And in fact, the BBC used to wipe series and um, wonderful Peter Cook and Dudley Moore series, not only but also. Nearly all those were wiped because the tapes were big. They, wanted, they didn't have enough storage. Spike Milligan, uh, Q5, which was just before Python and very much influenced us, um, that was wiped. We were terribly lucky to come along at the time the BBC just decided to keep um, the shows. In fact, we didn't believe that they would, and Terry had, had these wonderful, great early videos, reel-to-reel, -reel, huge things like Stonehenge, you know, <laughs> vast, great clunking bricks of tape, which he put in his garage, you know, because he thought he was going to be the keeper of the flame, because the BBC <laughs> were going to destroy them. So... So it was just about survival. We, we, we just went from, from series to series. Uh, I, I don't think there was... The, the, the first moment, and that's also in, in, in this collection here, is in 1974, when we had done three series. John had left, because he got, went on to do Faulty Towers. Um, and we made a series, the rest of us made a series of six programmes without John. And... You know, the BBC didn't seem terribly keen on them and all that, and we can't call them Monty Python's Flying Circus, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Just call it Monty Python. And then in the diary, it says, suddenly this news comes through from Nancy Lewis, who was our, our rep in the States, saying that um, public broadcasting uh, uh, stations in America had bought the Python shows. And within two or three months... Apparently, it had just spread like wildfire right across America. It started in Dallas. It started in Dallas, yeah. 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 There was a guy called Ron Duvillier from the Dallas Public Broadcasting Station came to New York to look for um, uh, BBC programmes, went to the BBC, found a few programmes, was going to leave, there was a downpour, um, he couldn't get to the airport, so he had to wait for an hour for it all to calm down. He said, have you got any other stuff? And he said, this circus thing at the bottom of the list, what's that? And so they went down to the basement, boom, 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 unlocked a sort of a rusty old key and found out this and gave it to him. And said, well, we, you know, I don't think you'll like it, but, you know, have it if you want. He took it back, showed it to some friends in Dallas. They said, brilliant. So they rang the BBC and said, have you got any more of those strange, rusty old tapes? <laughs> and they, oh, God, all right. Someone had to go down the stairs again. <laughs> 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 Uh, we've got 45 more. <laughs> he said, send them, I'll buy the lot. And he bought the lot, and he, pl he played them all over the weekend in Dallas, and it just took off. And places you'd think, you know, rather more sort of upmarket, trend-setting places like Boston, even New York, 
um, bought them only after Dallas. But anyway, it spread very, very fast, and, and this is a long way round of answering your question. <laughs> then we suddenly realised it was something quite special. I mean, we didn't see ourselves as legends or anything like that, but it was quite fantastic to see what Python meant mm. to the people in America. And these are people who we've been told endlessly would not understand it. And why should they understand Vickers playing cricket, you know? <laughs> um, no reason at all. But the fact they did, and they sort of, the kids, um, especially the high school students, sort of leapt at this. Then, uh, then I think we thought, well, we've got something quite, quite special here. By that time, we'd broken up. But we, um, <laughs> no, we, we, had, we made the films, and that was the interesting, again, which has dealt with their, the transition from television into making the movies. That's, that happens very rarely. I don't think any television team had ever done that before. And the fact that Holy Grail and, and, and uh, Brian, and to a certain extent, Meaning of Life, are still shown and people still like them. I mean, that was, uh, I'm very proud of that. Yeah, if, if, you, uh, if you're doing that thing or you're flicking through a channel and you go, you come across it, it, it is like, <gasps> yes! Yeah. It's kind of well, brilliant. Yeah. Um, last question from me you're before we, we raise the lights slightly to get some questions from the audience. What, what makes you laugh now? Well, uh, Paul Whitehouse, you know, and uh, the, the fast show, fast show yeah. sort of things I like. I, I thought the Harry Enfield and Paul Whitehouse thing about BBC Two was absolutely <laughs> brilliant. I just so love good impressions, you know. Even bad impressions I quite like, uh, the yeah. bravery of having a go. But, um, you know, Harry Enfield, Simon Sharma is, is, a, is a thing of <laughs> absolute joy to behold. Um, so I thought they were good. Um, you know, this, I don't watch an awful lot of, of, of telly, but uh, I love 2012 and being done on the BBC, brilliantly written, mm. captured the sort of silly speak of these places absolutely brilliantly. Yeah, um, yeah they were great. Okay, um, we have no microphones, so if you can just project, I'll then repeat the question so everyone else can hear if you can. We have microphones. We have microphones. They don't, but we <laughs> um, So if you'd like to raise your hand, and if you can stand up, gentlemen, second row, if you'd like to stand up and uh, give us your question. So we understand that uh, John's knees are unable to make it for silly walks. Yeah. But does that, <laughs> by extension, mean we're not going to see you taking a dive after a slap from a large fish? Ah, well, you heard that. John's knees are not going to uh, obviously allow him to do silly walks. Um, does that mean I'll not be taking a dive after being hit with a large fish? Um, you will see me being hit by a large fish, but it'll be on screen, unfortunately. Um, it's not something I could reproduce. And I'll tell you why, because when we did it at Teddington Lock, um, we rehearsed it, and it was sort of complicated with the music and all that, and slapping John with these pilchards. And wham, and yeah, we got it. And they say, okay, right, get ready, and action. And when we'd rehearsed it, um, the lock was full. <laughs> and suddenly, when we're doing it, the lock had emptied. <laughs> and there was about a 15-foot drop. And instead of saying no, I actually, rather bravely, just went on with it. And I did a fall that I'm very, very proud of. In fact, in my, <laughs> all the things in my career, that fall when being hit by the fish into the waters of Teddington Lock is something I, I, I really uh, I, I will, would like people to remember. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Anyway, that's a long way round of saying you won't be seeing that, but John, John hasn't been able to get his leg over for uh, silly walks. Hence the alimony. No. Um, don't go there, Michael. Don't go there. Uh, when we were doing the show in, in New York, uh, the City Centre show, back in 1976, John couldn't, uh, didn't want to do the City Walk, because it is actually very, very hard, very hard work. Um, but, uh, so we thought of getting a, a ballet dancer in, but they were, all, they were all employed at the time. How are you deciding what you're gonna, what's going to be in the live show and what's going to be live and what's going to feature on? Um, well, uh, Eric put together a sort of... Um, we discussed the kind of sketches that we thought people would want to see, mm. um, and, um, and Eric put together an order, and, and it, it, it covers most of the, the classics, but one or two which we've not done on stage before, like the Spanish Inquisition, which I think is going to be fun. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. I like the outfit. <laughs> <laughs> OK, next question. Uh, another gentleman in the second row. Would you like to stand up, please, sir? Uh, 
Uh, so, yes, influenced by Spike Milligan. Was I influenced by the goons or further back the crazy gang? Yeah, I mean, this thing about influence, it's not sort of something where you say, they've done it, we're going to do the same thing. It's just, are you on the same wavelength as somebody you admire? And I was absolutely on the wavelength of the goons. Uh, I just thought they were so liberating when I heard the first goon shows. And a friend of mine at school said, you've got to listen to the thing called The Goon Show, 8.30 on Tuesday night, wherever it was, and I used to um, listen to it. And, and it was kind of uh, embarrassing in a way because my, my parents didn't get it at all. You know, my father was sort of... Uh, and I prayed he wouldn't come into the room when I was listening to it. Whenever he came in the room, it was in the middle of one of the... Oh, hello, men, oh, go and get the key, oh, yeah. And he said, something wrong with the wireless? And I said, no, 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 no. no, it's meant to be like that. But the spirit, what they were trying to do, the anarchy, the surrealism, was absolutely, I'd say, liberating for me at the time. And to find that someone else was doing that, and I greatly admired the writers of that. And also, I thought Peter Sellers was just the most brilliant character actor and, and comedian and I, I, he was my sort of ideal um, or idol or whatever it was. So yes we're influenced by the goons. The crazy gang I didn't know so much about. Uh, can you then see where that's then worked with Python in terms of you can see comedy that's come after Python and how that's influenced or been kind of like mindedness in, in that type of thing? Yeah, occasionally, occasionally you'll see it in the way people kind of stop things before they've yeah, and they don't obey the usual beginning, middle and end, things like that that we did. Um, and I see quite a bit of Terry Gilliam's work is actually being used, but mo mainly in adverts. <laughs> Terry used to get very cross, you know, and people make enormous amounts of money plagiarising his work for adverts. Um, but he was, I mean, I, I think it's worth saying how really, really important Terry Gilliam was to the Python success, because he gave it a, an extra dimension, which no other comedy show had, really. Mm -hmm. There's brilliant animations, and he was on our wavelength, too. This guy from America, you know, who not, hadn't been to Oxford or Cambridge or anything like that, but he was absolutely on our wavelength and came at it from a, a very strong visual perspective. A, I was trying to find this bit where you... I can't remember which page it is now, because I've got so many bits of paper in here. But where you... Um, yeah, uh, you, where you say, thank, thank God for Terry Gillingham, I mean, and I don't think either of us said thank you to him in the room. I think it was after you'd, you'd watched. Yeah, right. Was it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we never say thank you to each other. That's a very much a group thing. <laughs> never really say thank you. And if anyone does anything individually that fails, we all love that. <laughs> <laughs> and John, whenever he talks about my travel programme, says, and Michael's off doing... <laughs> 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 it's brilliant. <laughs> it is. Sign of true and it honest is. friendship. Yeah. Uh, next question, please. Oh, we've got loads now. Great, OK. Um, there's two there. So the gentleman in the front, if you'd like to stand up first, then we'll get the gentleman behind you. Thank you. I, th I think it's the Dow you're referring to. Yeah, a really um, remarkable moment in all my travels. It was, I think it was the third episode of Around the World in 80 Days. And things hadn't been going terribly well, and we'd missed various boats, and we'd got a Dow, sort of uh, ancient, sort of traditional trading vessel, to take us uh, from Dubai to Bombay. It wasn't the Dow that we'd set up before. We didn't, only one of the crew spoke English. There were 18 Gujarati fishermen on it. It was pretty crowded anyway. There were no cabins or anything like that. It just had to lie out there on deck, and it was going to go very slowly. But it was the only way we could do it, um, whilst sticking to the rules of staying on, um, on land or sea and not going by plane. So we just had to go at their pace. And I think it was seven nights and eight days, going perilously slowly, and knowing that there's a big BBC series depending on us getting there. And I've never got so close to uh, people as I did on that. You know, the, 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 the people we, we spent time with were people of a completely different background to ourselves. You know, they, they, they were just very poor Muslim sailors, and here we were with all our technological stuff and our cameras, none of it any good. We depend on them and their seamanship to get us through. And so, you know, a real bond developed uh, in a nice way. And when we had to go, there was an old man called Kasim, um, and um, 
as we were going, there was this kind of set up scene. Oh, Michael, you just get off the boat, wave goodbye. So as wave goodbye, Kasim just comes up and he just hugged me. Yeah, it was just so moving. Um, and uh, so after that, I decided that there was no point in me pretending to act the traveller or the Englishman abroad. Just be yourself. React to how people react to you. And also, some of the very best material we've done ever since then have been encounters with ordinary people, not politicians or leaders of industry or royals or anything like that. Just the ordinary people uh, that we meet along the way. So, it was a, yeah, it was a very key moment, that. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman behind you, would you like to stand up, sir? Uh, I've got some sketches. Any, any, any new sketches? For any the new sketches? Uh, which row are you in? <laughs> 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 uh, well, we have some different t takes on old sketches. Yeah, I mean, the blackmail sketch is going to be slightly souped up to make it relevant <laughs> and hopefully funny. Um, and there's some new songs, and yeah, there, there will be some new material, but um, we're having enough difficulty learning the old material without you know, <laughs> styming our stuff with new stuff. But um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Next question. Lady up there. Yes, you. Stand up, please. Um, I think Susan Fry commented that you could see in the title that it's just an opera in English comedy, but yourself as a character is doing more silly and surrealist and sort of comedy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was interesting. The uh, observation of Stephen Fry is that you could see the difference between the Oxford and Cambridge writing uh, in Python, us being rather more silly and, uh, <laughs> and Cambridge a little more serious. Um, I, I think there are very strong, very strong differences. Um, I don't know whether it's just, with the possible exception of Bill Oddie, all the people who've been to Cambridge were over six foot. You know, they were all enormous. <laughs> and we were quite small. <laughs> When you're that tall, you, you've got to be fairly lofty. I mean, you, you know, that's the way your humour is. A bit declamatory and a bit pushy, a little bit like that, you know? You can't imagine Bill Oddy being Basil Fawlty, or indeed, you know, Terry Jones. But the little ones were sort of... Um, the smaller ones were, were at Oxford. And I have another theory, <laughs> another theory, which is that Cambridge... It's, it, this is a, um, 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 a climatological theory which is that Cambridge is in the Fens. It's very bleak. The wind blows. It's very cold most of the year. It's very sort of puritanical, whereas Oxford's in balmy valleys and bosky areas of Oxfordshire. It was the home of lost causes and all that, as John never ceases to point out. Um, <laughs> so we were just a little bit more relaxed, and we were perhaps a little more silly. We were a bit a little, perhaps a little more gentle. John used to call it a bit woolly. But um, you can just see... Uh, Look at Pete and Dud, you know, that's a good case in point. I think um, Peter was at Cambridge, over six foot, Dudley, smaller, <laughs> was, was at Oxford, you know. And um, <laughs> it really does work like this. I think even, even dogs and things like that were bigger <laughs> at Cambridge than they were at Oxford. But basically, we were comfortable, laid back, easy, happy, uh, content with our lot and our lives, and, and just saw the wonderful absurdity of life. Whereas for John and, and Eric and Graham, it was a bit more of a crusade against an unjust world. <laughs> <laughs> and very good that it was too, because the two styles of humour really sort of played off each other very well, I think. Very well. Great question. Uh, are you fanning yourself or are you asking... It? She's fanning herself. Um, the lady, <laughs> fanning yourself? Yeah, fanning yeah. 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 Lady on the end there, yeah. Hi. <laughs> I, thought you said, uh, I thought you said, are you finding yourself? <laughs> No, I thought <laughs> the accent. That we unlike. Um, yeah, on the end, would <laughs> like to stand up and ask a question, please. She's tall. She's she's one of them. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you said you're more of a character writing type thing. Yeah. Favorite character that you wrote or told? Favorite character. Well, uh, one one of my favorite characters was um, the centurion in the life of Brian. Uh, who was called, I think, Nisus Wetus. <laughs> and um, he is the one who sends them out to be crucified. Uh, one cross on the left, one cross each, and all that sort of thing. <laughs> and all I like about him, he, he doesn't want to be there. He's a, a child of liberal Roman parents. <laughs> he reads the Guardianum every morning and all that. Um, and he's been sent to this god-awful end of the empire 
with his unruly people that he doesn't like, but he does want to do his best. He believes, you know, in improving the lot of people, especially people in benighted lands. They shouldn't be put down, they shouldn't be reviled, they've got to be encouraged. So he's just absolutely set up for this. And he's just, and then when Eric comes along and says, uh, he says, uh, crucifixion. He says, no, no, I'll, I'll uh, be told I can go free and live on a desert island the rest of my life. <laughs> and he says, oh, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> oh, I'm, oh, that's I'm really good. I'm so pleased. And then <laughs> Eric says, no, no, it's crucifixion, really. Oh, yeah, no, I'm crucifixion. <laughs> I just love that little exchange. I, I, was, I enjoyed playing that character um, because... The whole idea of Life of Brown was to try and create characters that were relevant to the people we see nowadays, try and think what's the modern equivalent um, of, of the characters we play. And uh, I think that in that case it worked, yeah. Uh, next question. <clears throat> Gentleman right there, please stand. Mr. Uh, uh, Terry yeah. Gillingham will be doing animation at the O2. Oh, at the O2. Yes, he'll be animating away. Um, <laughs> no, a lot of the, uh, uh, um, the, the, the back cloth, the, the design of the show is very much Terry Gilliam's, which is great. And he is appearing, he will appear, he's, he's acting in various terribly uncomfortable roles. <laughs> uh, he always used to do, right from the very earliest stages, oh, I can't act, I can't act. He said, you can, Terry, you can. All you've got to do is put a suit of armour on and carry a chicken around. <laughs> and hit people with it every now and then. Oh, I can't do that, I don't want to do that, yeah. Um, so he'll be doing un the uncomfortable work and, and doing it rather grotesquely and, and brilliantly. There was wonderful, actually, going back to that same little um, sketch about the centurion, Terry Gilliam appears as the jailer's assistant. And <clears throat> Terry, at that time, just got married to the makeup designer, Maggie Weston. So, and Terry would say, you know, I've got to, have a, I got, got to make this makeup special. Anyway, we were all waiting for hour after hour. You know, this Terry, you know, he's not even got to speak. <laughs> he's just got to be there. And eventually, it turned out with this sensational makeup, which is a scar right the way down here, <laughs> and a shaved head. And he, he explained, he said, No, the guy, the guy has been uh, chopped. Half of his head has been chopped <laughs> by an axe. <laughs> and he couldn't get it right through the head. So they pull the axe out, and this is what's left. <laughs> that's all brilliant. <laughs> so um, that's, that's, that's what happens if you fall in love with a makeup artist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next question. Uh, up there, yes. Uh, did you enjoy, did you did enjoy doing the travel programmes? What an odd question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did it look I like you didn't? <laughs> eight years of my life on it. I'm not that much of a sucker. Um, I, I did, yeah. I mean... I loved, I loved the travelling, and, uh, uh, and I, at the same time, had terrible days, terrible feelings of doubt and disquiet about whether I could do it, whether we could continue doing it. There were very, very bad days, but on the whole, I enjoyed it um, enormously. And I just, I, I mean, I let myself in for eight series in the end, and I really wouldn't have done that, I think, unless there was, it was appealing to something inside me. Next question. There we go. Lady right there. Yeah, please stand. Yeah. Uh, what did it mean to get to that point of why you were called? Because it doesn't seem like life was that simple or complex. Well, that's a very interesting question. Is, is the internet, internet diluting, diluting comedy? comedy? I'll have to have a for drink while I think about yeah. that one. Uh, we've only, yeah, mm. we've only, yeah, okay. yeah, you go. Okay, go. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I, it's, it's very interesting. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I quite like the way people can take little bits and they can mash shows together and all that sort of thing. But there was certainly something about creating comedy in a world where you only had two television channels, when everything was focused on two or three uh, programmes, and there was a general feeling of, of a buzz around, of people all enjoying the same thing um, at the same time. And also, I think comedy thrives on restriction. It thrives on opposition. It thrives on people saying, you can't do this, you shouldn't do that, don't do this, no, no, stop that. And we live in a time now where really anyone can think anything and write about anything and say anything they want anywhere. And I think, if that's the point of your question, this has probably possibly diluted the, the way comedy comes 
back at you as a bit of opposition and all that. It's just everybody has little moments now where they can say what they think. But when, when Python was around and when Pete and Dud and the Goon Shows were around, that was truly ground, groundbreaking stuff. So maybe it does, um, it, it spreads it about a bit, and maybe it does dilute it. But I think, I think it's to do with attitudes nowadays. When we were much more conformist and the country was much more respectable and people wore bowler hats and pinstripe suits and behaved in a rather extraordinary way like that, then comedy thrived because it was comedy was based on sniggering and mischief and, and saying, God, these people look so silly. And nowadays, we don't really... Uh, silliness has been absorbed, really. I mean, the way we all look. It was interesting. <laughs> no, the other day, I was being driven over uh, down towards Blackfriars Bridge, and, and everyone was pouring over Blackfriars Bridge. It was rush hour. And I can remember in the 1950s and 60s, everyone would have been with briefcases, just like the characters we had in Python, in the pinstripe suit up like that, the waistcoat, hello, Mr. Johnson, hello, Mr. Johnson. Hundreds of them. You see it in the photos. Now... You can't see any, if you saw anyone like that, they'd be in a, in a film. Um, everyone was wearing what they wear at home. And that was quite an interesting thing, because my father never wore at home what he wore for work. And so there was a little sort of disconnect there, which it always, I think, gave, it, gave you some sort of little comic material. Sorry, I go on about that. Mm. A lady right there. Hello. Okay, yeah, and lady saying very nicely that Python is the one thing which people do sort of identify with. Even now, people use Python phrases, they look at the world in Pythonic ways. Yeah, yeah, and, and see, you said you're, 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 you're on the same wavelength, yeah. We're life. Your question was, I think, how, how do we feel about it? Well, the answer is you feel a little thrilled and a little bit scared at the same time. Um, you know, it's like, have you given birth to this? There must be other comedy and all that sort of stuff. But at the same time, um, it's great to share what made us laugh and the sort of things we, our view of the world, the way we looked at the world, to find that it's not just the six of us, which before that first show went out, it's all there in the diary, we thought, Isn't, maybe it's just... It's just the six of us who's going to find this ridiculous stuff funny, a sheep falling on someone's head, you know, to join the news. What's funny about that? So to find out that there are other people, not only then, but now, and two generations below Python, who still see something in Monty Python, it's very, it's, it's, it's very gratifying, and, and, and it, it makes you feel quite sort of humble in a way, in a silly sort of way. Hmm. It's good to be silly. Who's got the last question? Well, there's someone up there wafting a okay, piece of wafting. paper. Okay, wafting. I'm sorry, you know, we'll you're, you're in then. charge. No, no, it's fine. You're in charge. No, you're in charge. No, it's your This is your event. No, it's not my event. Well, no, it's, it's our event. event. Yeah. You, you run it. We'll you do control two. it. One each side then. So, <laughs> the wafter here. Can you stand up to waft? Ask. Graham. Well, yes, will we be acknowledging Graham at the O2 show? Absolutely we will. Um, and uh, now with the sort of technical um, apparatus available, we can use Graham, we can use clips of Graham. He'll be in there saying, this is very silly. Um, <laughs> and we'll be doing some songs of his and all that. So Graham will definitely be uh, there with us. In fact, we, we are sort of dedicating the show to him. But you will see quite a bit of Graham, yeah on the screen, <laughs> we think. He may turn up, you never know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he may turn up. Yeah, I wouldn't put it past him, he's a real joker. <laughs> <laughs> and gentlemen, second row there, please, last question. Hi. Will we take it to America? No, the, 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 there are just 10 shows at the O2, last one on July the 20th. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's lots of other things to do. I don't want to do Python for the rest of my life. Be, I thought uh, ten. I thought two shows would be very nice. Get together, have some fun. <laughs> you know, ten of these shows is is quite enough. Um, I also think it's very dangerous to sort of say, okay, we're going to go somewhere else, then we'll go somewhere else. If you say in advance, we're going to go to America, then people in Australia will feel very miffed if we don't go there, and the people in Germany and Finland and all these other places where they want us to go. So I think keep, keep the door firmly shut. 
I'm sorry, I'm not being UKIP. That is not a UKIP message. <laughs> 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 That's why the <laughs> last show not. of the live show is being yes, sent it, out to the, the rest of the world. The very last show of the live shows is going out on simulcast, I think it's yeah. called, which means yeah. that people in cinemas all over the world, instead of being able to see the film they've gone to see, they'll get bloody <laughs> Monty Python. <laughs> they won't be able you to get away from Tom it. Tom Cruise in the age of tomorrow. You yeah, Tom appears, Cruise. He'll be, yeah. Yeah, he'll be complaining. De Niro, all those people, they'll be very <laughs> pissed off. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Oh, what a shame. Lovely audience. Um, thank you very much thank indeed you so for much. coming along. Thank you. The wonderful Michael Palin, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>